Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Hey, great to be here with you again for another Tuesday edition episode. Well, hey, it's uh, man, what a week I've had. I had a, a very, very, very diverse week. So you heard last Tuesday we had taken our annual camping trip up to Stanley Lake, which was great. It was beautiful. My boat, I so I've got my grandpa's old Gregor aluminum fishing boat. And what we like to do is we like to pack it full of our stuff, put it in the water at the boat ramp, and then I drive it across the lake to a campsite that is most easily accessed by boat. And then we set it up and we've got a beautiful spot to camp. And all of that came true. We got it into the lake. I didn't tip it over. I didn't get all of our gear to the bottom of the lake. Started the engine up. Everything was going well. Went right across the lake to our campsite, tied it up, set up camp, got everything unloaded. And I was excited, and I was like, who wants to go for a boat ride? And Hattie was not too enthused. She just wanted to read her book, but Autumn was ready to go. And so uh, I got uh, got us back in the boat and kind of pulled us out away from the uh, the little inlet there that kind of wants to pull you down into the creek and started trying to start that boat motor. And you know what? It would not go. I can't believe it. It got me all the way across the lake, and then literally 30 minutes later, it would not start. And the the motor is a two-stroke Evinrude, not Johnston Evinrude, but just Evinrude, at least as far as I know, from 1964. And it had run very, very well, but it uh, would not start back up. And I tried, and I worked on it, and I tried, and I worked on it. I pulled the plugs. I, of course, broke the pull rope trying to get it started, so I rigged something with parachute cord and tried to get it going. I got it started a few times with the choke closed, and but as soon as I would open it and try and get it cranking, it wouldn't go. And then pretty soon that wouldn't even work, and ultimately I had to give up, pulled the motor off, and uh, it became a full-time rowboat for the rest of the weekend. But hey, it's beautiful up there, and uh, and that was great. So we did that, then got back and right back into irrigating, right back into uh, working cattle. Uh, we've got to castrate a bunch of pigs. And uh, it's just been a, it's been a whirlwind because I, I did a ton of work before going to get ready to be gone. And they get back, everything gets compressed into several days. I've had some late nights. And uh, if you heard my Saturday episode, <laughs> you know I recorded that at midnight on Friday. And so uh, everything got compressed. And so here I am. And I today I had an eye appointment. I was at the eye doctor. And you know they make you go at least once a year if you need if you want to buy more contact lenses. And since I still use contact lenses, I've got to go at least once a year. And the uh, the young lady who was kind of getting me set up when we first got there asked me how my weekend was, and I was so messed up on my schedule I had no idea it was Monday. Uh, I was like, what day is it? When was the weekend? So that's kind of how things went for me this weekend. But, hey, that's all right. We are back into the groove here, home on the farm. And I'll tell you what, uh, it is beautiful going on vacation. I absolutely love it. Love it up there. So pretty up in the Sawtooth Mountains of Idaho. But uh, getting home is no, uh, it's not a disappointment at all. Love it here, too. Love what we've got going on here. Autumn's back to work today. Today was her full first full day of work back. Uh, she's a school teacher, so... It's very interesting to see how that's all going to develop uh, this year for her and for her school district and school districts all around. And then Hattie will be going back in a couple weeks, but I think it's going to be like two days at school, two days online or something like that. We'll, We'll see how it all pans out. And by the way, speaking of Hattie, if you are listening to this episode on the day that it is released, well... Then happy birthday to Hattie, 14 years old today, freshman in high school, starting in the FFA, starting in the ROTC, going to play softball, got to make that team, but going to play softball, Uh, it's going to be great, man, I'm excited for her, Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun for her in high school, and she is just getting started on that journey, so really cool, we'll be, uh, she actually has a softball scrimmage tonight, so we'll be at that. And then we'll be celebrating her birthday. Well, kind of all day. I'm taking her out to a special lunch today. and A place she loves to get empanadas, of all things. I don't know if you guys have ever eaten many empanadas, but we've got a place in Boise called Tango's. And they deep fry these empanadas and bring them right out to you fresh, just, just cooked. And oh my goodness, these are the best, best, best things ever. 
And uh, I actually owe it to my aunt and uncle, Alan and Mary Romander. Alan, who's passed on, but he was my first ever guest on this show in episode number two. And they were up here visiting years ago, and uh, they'd been down to Argentina on a couple of different agricultural tours, and they discovered tangos here in Boise and uh, introduced me to the, to tangos and to, and to empanadas. And oh my goodness. Now, tangos is off the beaten path in Boise. They're still in town, but they're up on the bench. They're not in the touristy part of Boise. And so if you're ever here in Boise and you want some phenomenal food, a couple things to remember. The name is tangos. They're not too far from downtown. And if you're out riding bikes, it's actually uh, not too far off the green belt. You can ride the green belt up onto the bench and then just go, it dead ends on Orchard Avenue and just ride to Orchard Avenue for about a block and a half from where the green belt hits Orchard Avenue. And you'll be at Tango's. The other thing is get there early because they pack out every lunch. Uh, during COVID, it's even worse because there's no indoor seating. But uh, I don't know. So when we, we'll see when we go there uh, today for Hattie's special lunch, what it's looking like. But anyway, yeah, they are a great, great place, and I'm looking forward to that. So that's what we got going on today for Hattie's birthday, and uh, we'll be doing some more celebrating with the family uh, later this week. But anyway, so it's all been a whirlwind, and if any, if you guys are watching this on YouTube, then you are seeing that I have changed my studio around, and uh, so I've been dealing with that. So uh, there's been some upgrades I've wanted to make. And, you know, I've talked on this show before about that piece of equipment I bought back in 2014, which was the first time I ever spent any real money on a computer. And I bought a uh, MacBook Pro, a 13.3-inch screen MacBook Pro. And that thing has served me well to this day, absolutely to this day. It has served me wonderfully. But there was an upgrade that I wanted to make regarding video and Zoom interviews and things like that here in the studio, and I had to upgrade computers. The uh, the pre 2013, so I bought that in 2014, but it's a late 2013 MacBook Pro. It could not handle what I wanted to do for streaming and things like that on Zoom. So I had to upgrade computers. So I have been changing the studio around. I've been getting new equipment, new technology, trying to figure stuff out. And that is just all added on to everything I've been doing. And that is leading to a lot of late nights. But the hope is, the hope is that as we go forward, I'm bringing you a much better project, uh, product. And uh, any of you who want to watch our videos on YouTube or see the videos that we put out as previews on Facebook, on our Facebook page, hopefully those are all very much better for you. So uh, the late nights will pay off, I am sure. But I've uh, been dealing with that. And uh, that computer never failed me. I bought another Mac. Uh, and uh, did that, and so I've been getting that set up, but I bought one, you know, one that is uh, seven years newer in terms of technology, and therefore uh, more capable of dealing with what I'm trying to do, and I had to buy a bigger one. I had to buy a 16-inch Mac. They don't make a 13-inch that was capable of doing what I wanted to do, so interesting thing how things have progressed for me technology-wise over the years, but uh all this technology is uh, only getting used in the studio, not out on the farm, which is just fine by me. I love the, I love the, I don't know, the juxtaposition, the paradox of me coming into the studio and for me getting high tech, but then uh, spending the rest of my time outdoors doing manual labor. To me, that is the perfect combination. I get to, uh, I get to really dive into this tech stuff and be modern here in the studio. And outdoors, I get to uh, work with cattle and know how to move them and irrigate and solve problems out there. It really is just exactly the right fit for me. Well, I want to take a second, everybody, and talk about the Pioneer Tour podcast. So I've been hinting at this, and we officially launched on July 17th. I've done some promotion on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and that's not really my deal. My forte is right here behind this microphone talking to you. But I, I've done some promotion there. But I wanted to talk about that with you really quick, you guys. So you all know that starting last year, I was lucky enough to ho to host the Corn Revolution podcast for Pioneer. And man, what an eye-opening experience. What an absolute uh, flattering experience to be chosen to do that. And to even be called and to be in the running. Uh, was was awesome, but then to be chose to do that and to complete our first our first season, which you know when we first started out, it was just going to be 
10 or 12 episodes to announce the product line, the, the different varieties, the different hybrids that were coming out of Pioneer Corn Seed for 2019. But then we turned around, we did a second season at the end of 2019 to catch up with everybody on how these new varieties and hybrids performed. And then here we are back now, and we're going even bigger. We're doing the Pioneer Tour podcast, which now we're not focusing just on corn. We're still talking corn, but now we're talking corn, sorghum, wheat, alfalfa, uh, soybeans. Uh, It has been great. Uh, Man, I learn so much. And uh, I did an episode a, a long time ago on this show about being a jack of all trades. And and actually, when I was doing the, the Microphone Money podcast, teaching people how to create a, a podcasting business like the same way that I've done, I did an episode on that as well, being a generalist. And honestly, that has served me so very well. I have never gotten unbelievably specific with my knowledge in one area of agriculture, but I've always had a curious mind for all of it for every single bit of it and I'm just fascinated by it and uh, you know that's what's led me into this life into this career in agriculture and that has been such a benefit to me doing interviews for the Pioneer Tour podcast because I am talking to I'm talking to agronomists I am talking to wheat breeders I'm talking to nutritionists I, I I'm talking to people all over the board in terms of everything that Pioneer is doing to support agriculture and hearing great stories, just as an example, just great stories, stories where these these guys, especially these, these, these breeders, these seed breeders that are out in the field, uh, and agronomists as well, uh, people involved in dairy nutrition, so I shouldn't limit it to any one person or any one uh, position there at Pioneer, but, man, they are so... It's interesting uh, to talk with them and to hear how they make decisions, to hear how they share information, even with competitors, Uh, because to them, farming and agriculture and the survival and the success of farmers comes first. I mean, of course, they're very loyal and proud of Pioneer, but uh, it is absolutely a thrill to me to hear how agriculture and the success of farmers comes first and how they will share information with other people even if competitors will get that information and they can use it and it helps to give them a competitive advantage because it's helping farmers and that has been wonderful 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 to hear so i am telling you all this because i want to promote the heck out of the pioneer tour podcast i want you to check it out i want you to listen and uh, enjoy it because I'll tell you what it is. It's a whole nother way of of me uh, podcasting. Uh, it is highly produced. Uh, the uh, Bader Rudder, the advertising advertising agency out of Milwaukee, they do an unbelievable job in coordinating and putting all this together. Uh, it, I mean, it's great. I have I'm so much enjoying these new relationships I've made with these people, and everything that I get to do. And we want you to check that one out as well. I and I definitely want to promote it. I want you to listen to it. And uh, of course, it's another place to hear me, but hear me in a totally different way. So you can find the Pioneer Tour podcast. You can of course find it on iTunes. You can find it on Spotify. All those different places, wherever you're listening to podcasts right now, you can find it. But you can also go over to pioneer.com backslash US backslash tour backslash podcast. Man, I think it's got to be simpler than that. Hold on a second. I've read this outro a million times, and uh, I know it's easier than that. Um, Anyway, just tell you what. Google Pioneer Tour Podcast. It will come up. So right now, our episode's out. We've got the sorghum success story. I'm always fascinated with... uh, with sorghum ever since an interview I did with an FFA student from Kentucky making her own sorghum syrup and sending me a couple jars back in like 2015. Uh, fascinating. We just don't grow sorghum out here in Idaho or in the West. As far as I, I've never seen it. Ever, ever seen it. Uh, we did one called Test and Learn, the local breeder effect, factoring in more factors, firing all cylinders, and of course the welcome show. And we've got more episodes to come. we got some fascinating episodes coming up on the weather and what Pioneer does to replicate or even make their own weather to test things and how they can predict when big storms are going to hit, you know, in terms of brittle snap on corn and things like that. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, Something I was learning about sorghum, 
uh, in particular, uh, we're growing sorghum down in southeast Texas and northeast Mexico. And a new pest they're dealing with, uh, just fascinating stuff. And, and if you've got a mind and a curiosity about agriculture, you're going to love this show as well. Uh, and we even got into livestock. And so this is my third my third go-round hosting for Pioneer. And this time we even got into talking about livestock, which has been very interesting as well. So some of that's not out yet, but it's coming up. Uh, we're releasing new episodes all the time and would love it if you guys would check that out. That is the Pioneer Tour podcast. And boy, I think you would really, really enjoy it. Really enjoy it. And of course, focused largely on production agriculture. But man, what a fascinating field. Uh, just absolutely fascinating to me. So please, please check that out. Oh, and speaking of checking things out, how could I not segue into a promotion of our wonderful sponsors? If you're watching me on YouTube or if you're looking at any of my promos on Facebook, you see that I've changed up my set. I've still got the Montana State University flag behind me proudly displaying that bobcat and, of course, my Pioneer Seeds and uh, lacrosse and all of that right behind me. And, of course, lacrosse footwear is just an absolutely fantastic sponsor. We want you to go out, buy yourself a pair of Alpha Range boots. You will not go wrong. I, I, I vow that to you. That is why I am willing to advertise for them. I don't advertise for companies that I don't use and trust and that I'm not comfortable recommending to you, meaning I have made a vow that somebody cannot walk up to me or email me or whatever and offer me money and all of a sudden I'm a fan of their product. I'm going to do it the other way around when I'm a fan of their product. Then we'll talk about me advertising them for them. And that's exactly what has happened with lacrosse. I've gone through many different neoprene-based rubber boots until I finally got to the Alpha Range boots by lacrosse. And man, am I happy. Uh, going, I'm almost done with my second full year in my Alpha Range boots. They're not leaking. They're not breaking down. And I literally wear them every single day, whether it's irrigating in the summer feeding in the winter. It doesn't matter. In all conditions, I am wearing these boots. You, it's such a good investment because they're going to last you so long. You will be very, very happy with these boots. Please check them out. They're at lacrossefootwear.com and wherever you buy your agricultural clothing, whatever you need for safety equipment, you will find them there. If you don't, let them know that you want to buy lacrosse and you're going to find them somewhere. But uh, everything they've got to offer you there is over at lacrossefootwear.com, everybody. And then, of course, Powder River livestock handling equipment just so proud to be affiliated with this company for the same reasons i've known about powder river my entire life and now we proudly have a powder river squeeze chute as well as powder river cattle panels here on our farm for our cattle and of course all of that happened before they ever became a sponsor and i couldn't be more proud to be affiliated with this great great company we want you to do the same we want you to uh, we want when you're working cattle we want you to look at it as a good day, a good day where you get to put into practice those things you know that almost nobody in the world knows anymore, and especially nobody in the United States. I mean, we're talking 1% of people, 2% of people in the United States are farming, and probably 30, 40% of those people are raising cattle, maybe. And so we're talking a skill set that you've got that almost nobody else has. Almost nobody in the entire world, let alone especially the United States. And so when you go out to work cattle, when you go out to Dr. Pink Eye, when you go out to vaccinate, whatever it is you're going to be doing, pulling a calf, I want you to be proud and I want you to enjoy that moment because you are keeping something alive that not very many people know how to do. And I'll tell you what, if you have the wrong equipment, you're not going to enjoy that moment. It's not because you don't like the activity. It's not because you're not proud of what you're doing. It's because it's become such a stressful event to get things done because you don't have the right equipment that you're not enjoying it. So go out, get some powder river, get livestock panels, get yourself a great squeeze chute, get a sweep tub. It is an investment that's going to last you a lifetime and you're, it's going to pay off. You're going to be very, very happy with it. And then you can relish those moments and be proud of the fact that you're keeping heritage, you're keeping tradition alive, and you've got skills that very few other people have. You can find them over at powderriver.com, everybody. All right. So I mentioned that I am flying the Montana State flag in my studio. Uh, that is something I plan on doing 
for a long, long time. But sadly, I just found out that the Big Sky Conference, of which Montana State University is part of, has canceled their football season. They found this out two days ago uh, as I'm recording this. So three days ago as you're hearing it. And then, of course, several other conferences just today as I'm recording this have canceled. The Pac-12, the MAC, the Big Ten. And I'm sure there are more conferences coming after them that are going to cancel their college football seasons. And I will tell you, I do not like that. I do not like that at all. Now, I'm not saying it from a value sense. I'm not saying it because I'm obviously it's related to coronavirus. And I'm not saying I don't like it because of my belief system about coronavirus. I just don't like it for what I'm missing. And what's interesting is, I've all I, you know this time of year uh, here in in the Treasure Valley of Idaho, the temperatures always we always have like a week of cooler temperatures. We just kind of went through that a little bit, and temperatures always dip a little bit. And in our house out here on our farm, when the temperatures dip a little bit, we end up in the evenings with the the front door open, the screen door, you know, just the screen door closed, the screen door in the back, the breeze coming through. You can hear a vehicle going down the road. Uh, you can hear the goats. You can hear the chickens or the cattle or whatever that may be. And that is always a mark of what time of year we're getting to. And then as we get into late August and into early September, generally we've got that going on. And then you can hear crowd noise and you can hear sports on the TV. If we're in the house, uh, we'll have college football on, we'll have baseball on, and on Sundays we'll have the NFL on. And I will tell you, when they when they started baseball back up, Hattie and I were very, very excited. I am so proud of myself for raising a daughter that loves to watch baseball. But when we turned baseball on, there were a few things that were different, and I have not been able to get over the hurdle. So the first thing that's different, of course, is there's no fans. And they got all these cardboard cutouts of people there. And that's cute, I guess, you know, to make up for the fact that there's nobody in those seats. And they got the fake crowd noise. And, you know, honestly, uh, it works pretty good, I think. But uh, they've got that going on. And that hasn't really, I don't know, there's something about it that's just missing. It's unbelievable to me how important the crowds are for the experience of watching a baseball game. But then, and again, I'm not trying to make a value judgment, but then everyone's got BLM on their uniforms. They've got BLM, like, painted onto the field. And it's not that I've got something against Black Lives Matter. That is, has nothing to do with this at all. But I, I've heard people say for years that sports are supposed to be an escape. And what I've realized is as things have gotten infused into sports, how much they were an escape for me. How much I could just tune into the game and just love the game without having to think about any of that other stuff. It was just about the game. And it was about a place where, you know, any of us who disagreed on politics or whatever could come together and enjoy the game. And that's gone now. That is gone. Because there's these statements right there that you're you're looking at every time you watch the game. And I don't care if it's a conservative statement, a liberal statement, a democratic statement, a republican statement. I don't care what it is. It's there. And that they've infused now this part of our society into a place that used to be a safe haven from that. And that has that's had an impact on me. I will be honest with you. It's absolutely had an impact on me. So I haven't been watching as much baseball as I normally would, uh, which, you know, that bums me out. And now there's not going to be any Big Sky football, so there's not going to be any Montana State University games. And so we cannot beat Montana for, would this be five years in a row, six years in a row? We're not going to be able to do that. And and then, of course, other football conferences are falling like dominoes, and I, that's probably going to continue to happen. I don't know how the NFL is going to look, but I'm assuming it's going to be the same story with the NFL in terms of political statements and no fans in the stadium. We didn't have March Madness. I'm not a huge NBA fan. And uh, it's interesting because I always look forward to having those sports in the evenings when we come in or at lunch on a hot day, coming in and, and turning on a baseball game while we eat lunch or something like that. But I've never understood how much of an escape it was for me or how much I have, how much I would miss it 
until now it's gone or now it's so transformed and different, it's not even like the same thing. And man, what a perspective. You don't know what you have till it's gone, I guess, is what they say. So I am reeling in the fact there will be no Big Sky football, and uh, it's a totally different world for us right now. But uh, it is what it is. We'll see where this all goes. I hope we get done with this stuff very, very soon. Well, hey, one of my t- our dog Hub is uh, kicking the cupboard behind me here and making noise. Sorry about that. Oh, and if you heard my alarm go off a second ago, that's because I've got a uh, chicken going on the Traeger. And I am uh, I need to turn that temperature up. And I can do it from my phone, so I set an alarm. That's kind of cool. But anyway, I digress from that. One last thought. So I told you about my boat motor breaking down. Now, this is my grandfather's motor from 1964. 1964. So my grandfather had this boat. My dad and I finished with my grandfather on this boat. Then the boat and the motor went to my uncle. Then it went from my uncle to me. And I've caught fish on it. My uncle has. My dad has. uh, My grandfather did. And my daughter has. Hattie has as well. So you got four generations of people catching fish on this boat. So when when this motor went down, and it went down hard. I could not figure out what to do to get it done, to get it going. When it went down, I was really, really disheartened. And I had been into, we have a local uh, boat shop and repair place uh, here in Cuna. I had been in there getting ready for the trip, buying a couple parts. And I saw that they had an outboard in there that had been marked down. And I thought, well, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time I buy a new outboard. I get to a four-stroke. I kind of get in something more modern maybe a little bit more reliable, maybe it's time. And I went in there, and I thought that the, the outboard I'd been looking at had been marked down from like 1250 to 750 But boy, was I wrong. It had been marked down from 3250 to $2,750. $2, Outboards are expensive. And I was like, uh-oh, I am not, I am not, I, I don't want to give up my grandpa's motor, and uh, I definitely don't want to spend this on an outboard to do that. So what am I going to do? So I checked. They referred me to a nice gentleman who does work out of his house who fixes outboard motors. He just does Evinrude, uh, Volvo, Evinrude Johnson or Johnson and Evinrude. He does Mercury. And I think one other, maybe Honda or something like that. They referred me to this gentleman. I called this, this gentleman. He said it would be about $250 to get my motor back to where it needs to be. And I said, sold. I am absolutely thrilled to bring it to you. And I went over to his place. And he is, he's got to be late 70s, I would say. Uh, Regular residential house. A little bit larger lot, but nothing major. And he's got boats parked all over. He's working on outboard motors. He is as happy as could be. Very, very friendly, very happy, and very pleased to take my motor and work on it for me and get it going again. And looked looked at the outboard I had and said, oh, this is a great outboard. It's a really, really good one. We'll get it going for you. This thing's still going to last you for years upon years upon years, which made I was thrilled with because I did not want to give up my grandfather's outboard. And I was looking at what he was doing there, and I was seeing visions of my retirement. And it's tough because as I as I envision retirement, I don't envision me stopping working. Now, I do envision me never, ever doing work again that I don't want to do at least on a full-time basis. Obviously, things are going to come up, and I'm going to have to do things that I don't necessarily, you know, I would not necessarily choose. That'll happen from time to time. But I don't see me ever stopping working. I love being productive. I love doing something with my day that is productive in that manner. And I don't see me ever stopping. And I was looking at this gentleman, and he just couldn't be happier. And, uh, you know, for people who are looking, and they're trying to figure out, what am I going to do to retire? How am I going to be able to do this? I looked at this guy and I go, this is the answer right here. What can you do? What can you do that will allow you to make money? If you still need to continue to make money after the age of 65 or after the you've come to your eligible retirement from your job, what can you do to make that happen? Well, can you come up with some sort of a skill or a craft or something that you can do on your own terms? And it really made me think about when I was leaving the police department back in 2013, there were so many people there who, right when they were getting ready to retire, they were so disheartened with work. And they thought work meant a job I don't like. 
without the understanding that you can find work that you really, really enjoy. It's just the job that you don't currently like that makes you think you don't like work, but that's not it. It's the job. But so many people who retire in that situation are determined to never work again because they think it's work that they hate, but it's not. It's the job they don't like. And I looked at this gentleman who's repairing these outboard motors, and that's exactly the thought I had. I wish I could take whatever's in his mind that helped him to go, I, I enjoy doing this, I can make some money doing it, and I can do it right from my home on my own terms. I mean, if he wants to leave for the winter, he can leave for the winter. If he wants to leave for the day and go fishing, he can leave for the day and go fishing. He's got total freedom, but none of us are going to spend every waking hour doing a hobby. None of us are going to spend every waking hour playing a sport or going hiking or going fishing or whatever that may be. And he's filling that time with something productive that's beneficial to him and his family. And maybe it's just extra income. Maybe he needs the income. I don't know. I don't know. But I just wanted to take what was in his mind, his perspective, and bottle that and just sell it to everybody. And just to have everybody just... I don't know, drink this magic potion and come up with this image of retirement, which is I'm not going to stop working because i got to fill my time somehow. i got to keep my brain active, my body active. I've got to keep my body young in the sense that it's got a purpose every single day. And so I'm going to keep working, but I'm going to do it on my terms. And that is truly with the beginning of the Off Farm Income podcast all the way back almost six years ago in 2014, That was the purpose of this show at the very, very outset, was just to give somebody the ability to shift their mindset from thinking that work is something they hate to understanding it's the wrong fit, the wrong job they have, but work is truly a blessing. So I'm going to leave you with that today, everybody. I wanted to tell you about that gentleman, and it all ties together today. Well, everybody, as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.